right, another totally rewarding chat. And I have Philip Shook with me. And I know I just practiced this, but how did I do? Quite well. All right, all right, awesome. From Gradar, um, nice to have you. From uh, where in Germany? It's uh, Düsseldorf. Okay. So it's in the western part of Germany. Yeah, no, one of my favorite. Uh, actually, I'm not gonna lie, we didn't talk about this before, but uh, one of my favorite places to run along the run, run along the river. Like it is. It's it's beautiful, and it's it's a city um, where the river Rhine goes through its middle. So it's it's perfect. It's very yeah. open, very green. It's, it's beautiful. And I'm amazed always at the bike pass. You could literally bike from there to like anywhere in like Germany. Uh, yeah, and it's flat. So all the way down to the Netherlands. So it's good riding. It's fun. Um, so why don't we start with, you just give us your elevator pitch or your history. Um, you can take however many floors in your building you need with your elevator. Um, but let's get the elevator pitch. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Philip Schuck. I'm the founder um, of, of Grader. Grader is a cutting edge uh, job evaluation and compensation platform. And it's transforming the entire industry as we have um, used consulting knowledge and put it into a product and make it available as a very comprehensive and cost-effective SaaS solution. Um, the core of the product is job evaluation and job architecture management, but related to the job evaluation results um, are um, options for salary benchmarks, um, job specific competencies, AI generated job descriptions, and uh, gender pay gap um, analysis features that would also support um, compensation structuring efforts in an organization. And um... So did you magically end up at this job or how, wh where were you at before and how, how'd you get, how'd you get to the point at which you said, I need to, I need to build this thing? Uh, well, I started um, as a um, strategic rewards consultant, um, supporting clients with benchmarking surveys and grading projects and, and pay bands and all of these things. And at some point I realized there are so many smart and, and, uh, well-trained HR and rewards professionals out there, they don't need this type of consulting support. They just need a software um, for their daily tasks. And so um, I figured, okay, I could be the one building this software. It's a niche market. Um, and there's still a market for all the consultants out there, but we have so many clients, um, more than 400 in total uh, by now, that use uh, our product pretty much independent from any kind of consulting support. Gotcha. Um, so to prove you're human, what do you do? Uh, what do you do for fun outside of work? I know you have a young one, so, you know, this is yeah. a good question. That's, I've got three of them. So <laughs> that's, I, I, I used to run uh, an, an ambulance. Um, or I used to drive an ambulance when I was younger and I did this as a voluntary, um, EMT for, for a while, but I, I don't, I just don't have the time for this anymore. There are three children and their hobbies take up all the time that I have. Yeah, their hobbies become your hobbies. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. At least I'm watching them play hockey and well, field hockey, not uh, ice hockey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's my life now. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense um, for sure with, with three. So let's just start with grading. So like, let's, let's take a step back and say why, you know, what is it exactly? Um, for those that, you know, um, don't know exactly what grading ever heard the term or the synonyms yeah. and why, why should people even think about doing this? Yeah. So job grading, and that's where the name grader comes from, um, is a synonym for job evaluation. And job evaluation is basically a process that looks at the requirements of a job and um, such as responsibilities, um, the skills required, the complexity and working conditions maybe, and then comes up um, with a ranking order of the jobs. And there's something that is called point factor-based job evaluation, and this is exactly what Grader does. Okay. And job evaluation is used not only to, to build this rank order, of jobs, but also to determine um, jobs of equal value. And uh, the equal value of work is one of the key concepts of um, pay transparency 
uh, legislation in Europe and in, in many other countries. So, in, in, yeah. so yeah, let's go. We're, we're not so far behind. We're behind, but we're not so far behind. <laughs> what? Yeah. what? Yeah. what? I'll, I'll let it go. I won't even make you comment. So how how do people get started with that? And what's how's the what's the process? Yeah. Because it sounds I mean, if you have 10 people in your company, grading 10 sounds not so bad. Um, if you have right. 2,000 people in your company across 12 countries, um, this right. sounds reasonably miserable to try to go through and, and give points and scores to everybody. Yes. So can you walk through that process? Yeah. So, so the first step is to differentiate from um, the incumbents or the people holding the jobs, which means you would identify the unique jobs in your organization. So all those that are called specialist finance or accountant or expert finance or expert one, two, three in finance, those position titles would be consolidated onto unique jobs. So that at the end of the day, you might have something like a junior accountant, accountant and a senior accountant, a specialist, senior specialist, and an expert in finance. And then you would map the employees against these jobs and then start evaluating the jobs. And this could be based on a job description, or it could be based on uh, the results or input from an interview setting. And the interview might be with um, people managers um, that know a lot about the jobs or with um, subject matter experts. And you would then apply the different factors from the job evaluation system to um, get the grade for each job and then put these jobs into this uh, ranking order. And that's a very different uh, approach. It's we, we call it it's a very it's a value driven approach. So the grade is a value and it doesn't tell us anything about the price of the labor yet. And I think that's the big difference to an an American practice where the price of labor is often in the foreground. So where you would be looking into different market surveys to see uh, how much other market participants are paying for the job of an accountant or a junior accountant. Yeah, I've often said, I think um, Europe, Europeans, and by the way, I, um, despite being American, I know Europe is more than one country. Um, Europeans basically grade first and then look at the role. Americans yeah. will look at a role first and then potentially put it in a grade. Um, and that's how they yeah. kind of market price, um, you know, not for all and don't want to generalize, but that's generally that you're right. They look at this is how much this role pays. So then it must be in this grade. This one is this grade. So now maybe it pays this type, you know, this range is kind of the European mode. Um, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the outcome in, in with our European customers is often that they have um, the job grading and they use this to establish a fair and rational pay structure, for example, based on grades and job families or just grades and then set up pay bands that would define the minimum and maximum level of pay. And those pay bands, they are not necessarily driven by market rates. So we have many clients that wouldn't even use market surveys to determine uh, the, the pay bands, but only have a look at their internal compensation at the moment. So this is a, yet again, this is the very different approach. Um, and this might be due to um, the prevalence of um, labor agreements or collective labor agreements in the markets um, or just a different tradition. But it's it's very typical to align the jobs first to create career paths and then work with grade based uh, pay structures. OK. And so what's the easiest way to start? I mean, is it, you know, obviously you've got a tool and, you know, I don't want you to not talk about the tool, but you know, where, where's the easiest place? Is it gathering up your employees? Is it trying to get job descriptions? Are job descriptions required to start? Or do you, yeah. you know, how do you, you know, basically take a mess of, you know, we've got a thousand person company. Um, yeah. How do we start the process of getting yeah. everyone graded? Yeah. Um, so the first step is to gather data. Um, and the easiest thing to do this is um, to have an Excel file. <laughs> And then um, maybe the names of the employees uh, together with their current uh, position titles align those entries with um, departments and, if possible, job families. 
and maybe other information that exists in the organization. Um, but the reality is that, for example, job descriptions often do not exist or are of very poor quality because they are totally outdated or weren't written right. Um, so, yeah, gather as much information as possible. That's that's really our advice. And then the step to consolidate those position titles into jobs, into unique jobs, that's the, the, the biggest part, really, before you can actually start with a job evaluation exercise. So do you have to have an internal job architecture or career framework that is consistent to start doing this? Because what's considered a, you know, one title in one country is a different yeah. title in another country is a different title in another country. And so do you do this country by country or are you trying to get a consistent framework across the whole company? Yeah. Um, that's a kind of a philosophical question, I would say. Um, so I think the reality is that using a one size fits all often doesn't work. This, this might work in very mature organizations um, that have spent a lot of time and effort on, on building a consistent um, career framework with consistent career paths and consistent titles. But when we come into an organization, they are often in a position where they don't have anything. So they will have a great variety of uh, job titles and using the job grading approach or the job evaluation approach that looks at not at the title, but at the requirements of the jobs will actually help them to, to speak a common language across different entities, across different countries. And I think that's the, the, the big um, advantage of using this, this point factor based approach. Okay. And then the outcome is a job architecture where you can have rules and where you can have common uh, typical titles, whether they are internal or also external is to be defined, but, um, that's a very typical outcome of, in, of such an exercise. Well, I mean, it makes sense because then you start thinking about where I want to hire, what I want to do, and I'm, I'm comparing apples to apples. Um, and I think I've been, my soapboxes, I've been out around, um, especially around pay equity is a good example of getting your data in place and making sure you have not just apples to oranges isn't good anymore. It's not just, you know, red apples to red apples. It's actually got to be the right kind of apple to the right kind of yeah. apple um, to be able to compare for pay equity. So what's the biggest hurdle? So, you know, as you're looking at companies, um, it sounds so easy to do. Um, and it sounds like, you know, everyone should do it. So why isn't everyone doing it, um, you know, currently? That's a very good point. Um, so, and yet again, I think we can talk about differences in, 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 in different in, in organization setups. So in European organizations, we see rewards professionals as a role um, emerge at maybe a thousand employees, but that's okay. a big maybe. So it's more likely to really have them in organizations with more than two and a half thousand uh, employees. Whereas when I look at American organizations, um, the size of the organization is probably much smaller where you have this type of specialized role. Yeah, I so, say about 500 in the US is somewhere, you know, give or take is where they start to get rewards. Don't, yeah. don't let, you know, I will say part of the rationale for that is generally because of our, uh, and we will not talk anymore about it, our benefits uh, system here yeah. creates the need to have um, more professionals in that space um, around the comp, comp and ben side. Yeah, and then, and then, um, when you look at European organizations, many of them will be using some kind of collective labor agreement. So they don't really have the need to have this kind of support for a very small population that is exempt in a more classic sense. Um, so that's, that's maybe one of the reasons why it's, um, but 2027 is coming. So well, and 2027 has got basically you know, it's going to have requirements that are for organizations significantly yeah. smaller than a thousand people. Um, and I know people think 2027 seems so far away, but it's probably by the time you do all the work to get yourself ready, it's it's two to maybe four comp cycles to get yourself yeah. scored away. Um, so how do you get or, you know, how do you see this all playing out? Because it's you've got yeah. comp professionals down 
not available comp rewards professionals, not in the size space that no. some of these countries are requiring to have transparency. Absolutely. So what the European Union did last year was they issued an, a directive on pay transparency and a key concept of this directive and a key requirement is for organizations with 100 at the latest stage or 150 um, employees starting in 2027 to report their gender pay gap yep. and to use um, a way to determine work of equal value. So job evaluation um, to define pay bands and um, to run the analysis on. So this is a huge jump for many organizations that don't have anything in place today. Yeah, and when we, they, 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 you know, this is where, you know, you had, a th you know, a thousand people, you know, to 1500 is where they had a rewards professional. And now you've got somebody exactly. in a 200 person shop is going to yeah. have to try to figure all this out. Right. Absolutely. And this is, um, I mean, we, we see this challenge every day. So an organization starts using Gradar and it could be a 12,000 employee organization or 20,000 employee organization that didn't have anything in the past. So, and it takes them years to build their job architecture and to really start living the processes and embed it in their systems. And now the EU is asking um, organizations with 100 or 150 um, employees to do the same. And I think this is going to overwhelm many HR departments because it is additional time needed to do this and it's an additional skill set needed and many of them might not have it. So, and at the same time, there are not enough consultants out there um, who could support with um, this, uh, such an endeavor. Um, so the EU is basically asking organizations to build super professional rewards management practices. Um, and the reality is that many organizations aren't there yet at all, or haven't even started at all. So this is going to be, um, huge for organizations in Europe to comply. How long, how long, if, you know, let's take that 250 person, you know, company that now has to comply and figure all this out. I mean, how long do you think it would take them? And we can talk a little bit about tech, but with yeah. every technology to go through a process to have everyone graded. Yeah. So, so such an organization might have about 100 unique jobs in the organization. And as a rule of thumb, um, we can say uh, you can evaluate about 25 jobs a day. If you're sitting in, in, in a simple interview setup, or if you use um, well-written uh, job descriptions together with HR, then this is um, a rough number that, that can be managed per day. So it would take them between four and maybe five days to evaluate all jobs. But this doesn't include preparing the data mapping the employees against the correct jobs, talking mm -hmm. to your different stakeholders, like your um, employee representatives, the, the wonderful Betriebsräte in, in, in Germany and, and, and so on. Um, so that's an, another time that, that would have to be calculated. And then obviously, once you have the job evaluation results, you've got to run the gender pay gap analysis. You've got to start building the pay bands and ideally implement some processes, maybe in an HRIS, um, so that you um, can actually use these um, methods and tools in a sustainable manner. Yet again, this, this describes a problem because the market for HR systems in Europe is pretty much untapped. So there are some vendors out there and you have like Personio or Factorial or Bisneo in, in Spain or Efficient in Belgium. They do have um, amazing systems, but they all lack um, proper support for um, compensation management. They're not very good at this. So I think many HR departments will then rely on an Excel-based solution, which isn't ideal and um, might not be well thought through because they have never done it before. Yeah, so well, from our, from our perspective, it's really interesting because we're, you know, obviously we're, we're on the comp planning end of the, we have the comp planning piece, right? Mm -hmm. A new pay equity analysis inside the suite of tools. Um, but the grading, of course, all that is always, I've got a cool pyramid you would appreciate. I talk about pay equity uh, when I'm out just having the right data again. And, and you've got to have those jobs graded 
and all that work done first, then you can do your analysis, then you can roll it into a comp planning tool with remediation factors and a plan. But obviously, if the foundation isn't right, everything you roll up through the next suite of tools tends to, you know, it, it won't be correct, is going to be the fundamental problem. Yeah, absolutely. And the so organizations do not have the job evaluation in place and they do not have tech in place that could support them with this either. And that's so um, the big problem, I guess. So let's say, you know, because um, comp is a service, I think you mentioned it earlier. I think comp as a service is going to be an interesting thing to hear. Um, you don't want to hire another person. Um, a comp as a service to me is, you know, there's going to be people very proficient to coming in and grading your jobs and getting everything squared away. They'll come in, have a tool in place, you know, um, for this, for, you know, for this, obviously, we they would be picking greater. Um, you know, there might be an organization that has greater that comes in and does it and then leaves that as the, the tech behind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you think that still is like a month is a reasonable time if somebody kind of understands what's going on? Because, you know, you start to block the, these things out. I think personally, you've got 25, 26, 27 coming. In 27, you have to kind of report or face, you know, penalties. You know, who knows what the... Mm -hmm actual legal ramifications will be, although they don't look good, is what, what they don't look. Um, assuming you got it together this year, you'd only have 26 and 27 for most companies who do one cycle a year to remediate, yeah. to get themselves under the bar. Um, so for me, it's like, is a month reasonable for people to try to find a month when all the other stuff they have going on um, before they get to the year? Yeah, um, I mean, if you can really focus on on the topics for months, then this this might be impossible, especially in, a, in an SME with two hundred and fifty employees. So this That's this what could... the service is right. So if you outsource it, um, and they're familiar with the tech, I mean, there's always the to yeah. me the question is if you're going to interview, um, and I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm much I'm more familiar with um, I, IPE and. and uh, Mm -hmm. points of dating myself with hey corn fairy points um but the you know that process still takes time in the interviews etc that assumes the company's got people available right because you know the project the gantt chart always looks great on paper until no one's schedules open yeah 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 i can yeah this 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 is the the, the biggest challenge so when you don't have the skills in-house you at least need somebody who will do the project management and who will get the different stakeholders um, in the same room um, so that, that you can actually talk to them. And our suggestion would always be find someone in your HR team um, who is interested to learn um, the methodology and who's interested to learn about uh, how, to design, how to design pay bands and how to manage pay afterwards um, so that uh, we can have this effect of uh, em empowerment for the entire HR team. So that's um, what our preference would always be. I think that the classic approach of consultants in the past was, hey, we're going to deliver something. There's an Excel sheet. There's a PowerPoint slide deck. Um, here you go, work with this. But they often did a poor job in really empowering and educating their, their clients and how to use them, who's, or how to use this information and the data. Well, there's, two, there's always two parts to that. The pessimistic side of me, of course, would be if you teach a man to fish um, and you're a fisherman, um, it's, it's not great for you long term, right? So the consultants, um, and if they're good consultants, they also, most of the work they did, to be a little more fair, would be something that you fix it and then it might not need fixing again, right? For three years, right? Here's my pay philosophy, here's my structure. You don't, something you don't want to change all the time. So if they do a really good job, it's not something you need it again. Whereas, um, I don't know if you've heard the term wicked problem. But if you Google mm -hmm. wicked problem, not just because I'm from the Northeast, but, um, you know, it's a problem that always changes. And so you're adding people, your company's growing, um, mm -hmm. people are, you're hiring people higher in the range. You have to repoint people. Like I've got, got stuff going on, pay equity. It just can't be solved. Check the box and I'll come back to it in two years mm -hmm. and do an audit. It just changes all the time. The interesting piece is going to be, and this is, not clear yet, really, but um, we have recently had um, um, some cases in court where the, the the judges said, "Okay, you need you as an organization need to be able to really 
prove why somebody is being paid a certain amount. And this concept um, is very close to thinking that we know from collective labor agreements where pay is exactly defined uh, based on the, the, the grade, for example, and where there's very little room for, for differentiation. And this is something that is going to change. I think in the past we were able to use um, pay bands where the minimum and maximum level yeah. of pay were defined uh, to make an informed decision or to ask our managers to make an informed decision. But now I think you need to have more rules. And this is when, when I talk about empowerment, we need to empower HR um, to support their managers to make not only those informed decisions, but to also use the new rules um, appropriately. And the rules could be maybe based on grade and job family and then performance management. But at the same time, we all know how not so well performant management is being performed. Yeah, in many I mean, even, in, even in a given company, we always pick on marketing, but marketing will give everyone fives and development will be harder and a five is impossible to get. And so you can't compare. I'm, I'm actually really curious over time with these small organizations. I mean, you're talking about 250 people. You said they might have 100 roles. So you start doing the math on determining pay equity where you're going to have sample sizes of one to three. Um, how do you determine if there's bias um, and pay equity? And so I'm very curious long term, will countries in the EU allow you to compare yourself versus like graded organizations so you can figure out that my gap um, I'm, I'm curious. I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm no. curious if they will allow, because if I've got two accountants um, in there, it, it, you know, somewhere, even if I use multivariate regression, the sample size is too small, right? So yeah. can I use it against everybody who's potentially on radar or potentially on somewhere else to basically use that as a defensible mechanism to say, look, I'm not, I'm still not a great payer, right? Because I can't fix the problem that there's a gap, but the gap is actually significantly smaller or within the 5% bound based on a larger sample size. But the only way that'll work, it, that where, where my brain falls apart every time on this, is everyone yep. has to be graded the same, almost like you were one company, so that you can compare, you know, like I said, not just red apples, red apples, but, you know, Mac apples to Mac apples across companies. Before this happens, I think um, we're going to see an analysis in, within your own organization that will be looking at uh, work of equal value. So it might not be that in the analysis based on the job, but on all the jobs in grade 10 God, and God, all the jobs in grade 8. It mean becomes a sample size, not accountants in grade 10. Um, gotcha. Yeah, so that's, and that's, I think, the concept or one of the core concepts behind the uh, pay transparency directive. Um, that we're going to see work of equal value being used uh, much, much more often than in the past. Gotcha. So any other last, I don't want to say last words, that sounds awful, but, you know, kind of last words around grading or anything else? Um, you know, the exciting thing that is job grading? <laughs> well, as I said earlier, um, I think it's the solution to, to many um, different aspects within an organization. Um, so... We see it as a key requirement for transparency. And the concept is a given when I look at the uh, pay transparency directive. Um, we see it as a uh, core requirement when you start defining your own pay bands, uh, when you just start defining career paths. Yeah. Um, when I look at the grader tool, we have the ability these days to use the, the input from the grading exercise to generate, with the help of an AI, uh, to generate job descriptions. And to have things like um, um, job specific competencies in place. So it's really job grading is at the core of any job architecture, especially when you combine it with job families, so that you can really um, yeah, connect rewards practices and talent management um, policies and processes. And that's what I find super exciting. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, um, I guess I'll phrase it slightly different. I, I find job grading, having done it a couple of places or whatever, as kind of the most um, mundane, boring thing I want to do least, Philip. And I say that with the utmost respect because all the really cool stuff that then comes when you start tying analytics together, doing analytics yeah. about what's gonna happen in predictive analytics, 
all require this thing that I personally don't want to sit down and do, but, but to be able to compare all those things kind of in any analytics of truth, I think it is really critical. And so as much as it doesn't seem like real fun to sit down and go through, even for you know, a company to spend four weeks, interview people, make sure it's there. I think both the defensibility, having it done, having it in a neutral system, like I think there's just a lot of good things that come from it. Um, and thank goodness you built a tool because I've, you know, messed around with the old school method of, of doing it. And that is even less fun. Absolutely. And um, some people actually like using our tool. And when, when I see at the, uh, when I look at the user statistics and I see that some organizations have dozens of um, evaluators or HR business partners that would access the system on a daily basis to see their job descriptions, to see the competency profiles, to see the pay bands and market data. That's, that's, I mean, that's, I think we're doing something right there. Oh, I think so. And, and don't get me wrong. I know people I've worked with in the past, they love it and they're really good at it. Um, and organizations that get it right, I think yeah. not only is it going to be required. So there's a part of me who kind of like, okay, transparency is not only, you know, everyone should be a, a fair pair, but there's going to be other, I think, upsides for organizations. I think organizations will be short-sighted if they just use the grading and get everybody graded and just use it for transparency. I, I think there's some really cool analytical items around predictive analytics and how you grow your company and how you you know become more profitable once you have that ready to be consistent across all the jobs. I, I think it's going to be super cool. Yeah, I've talked to a couple of um, prospects uh, lately and, and they all said, hey, we finally have this leverage over our uh, management team um, to start using a job grading system because it's a requirement. Yeah. And they know how many good things you can do based on this foundation. So yeah, for us, I think it's, it's going to be great. Um, as a business uh, to, to have this. And at the same time, on, on, on the level of the entire society, we're going to see much, much more um, professional rewards practices than in the past. And I think this in itself is a huge benefit for society. No, oh, that'll be great. Um, and before we go, are you watching the, you know, any of the Euro Cup, any predictions? Because by the time this comes out, you know, um, we'll know if you're right or wrong. Well, oh, my. Well, I think Apple for Germany. I, I'm, I'm rooting for Germany, obviously, but uh, I'm also quarter Dutch, so that's oh, tough. And the Dutch, they're going to play. I think they're playing in Düsseldorf tonight yeah. um, or tomorrow or something. So that's going to be. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't put the orange one though. I'm surprised you didn't. You didn't wear orange today. Yeah. So. Well, that's a good point. Uh, well, you know, maybe the baby, you know, sped on it or something. Yeah, that, that could be. Uh, this has been great. So um, for those that are watching, you can see Philip's information there. It's greatr.com. We usually, um, unless I make a mistake, we have his email as well out there. Um, you know, and Philip's been great with everybody that I've sent his way to, you know, to do demos, to walk through and kind of no matter the level. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, Anytime. Awesome. Thanks so much. You're most welcome.